Um, so I, indeed, I did begin back at uh, the end of World War II. Um, I was born during the war, and I remember when my two half-brothers, much older than I, came home from the war. Um, and I can't really start, I can't continue, I can't finish this discussion without evoking them because they were both very important in, in my learning how to do this. The first one, uh, the older of the two named Dalton, came back first and I do remember the afternoon uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland when he set me down on some steps outside the house and said, now, what would you like me to do for you? What would you like me to make? Would you like me to make you a model helicopter? And I, I know from the facts of this meeting that I couldn't have been five, uh, or not more than five anyway, and uh, somehow I said, yeah, sure, yeah, that's what I want, yeah. Um, and I started watching him do this. Now, I realize in retrospect that I could hardly even have known what a helicopter was when he said this. Um, and what did I know what a model was even? Um, but I can remember him doing this. I can remember him taking up a piece of pine, planking, and starting to carve with a whittling knife a, a helicopter. And as it took shape in his hands, I could begin to see windows and doors and other sort of details that he was working on. And of course, he was talking with Blue Streak about this and where was he going to get rotors for it. And probably that has something to do with how this all turned out. But the point is, again, that at five years old, I knew what he was doing or I was learning as I watched it. And I was already distinctly imagining people behind the windows and doors. And I imagine now, although I really can't honestly tell you that I knew all of this was going on or that I know what was going on then, probably making up sort of stories about what the people were doing in my head, that they were rescuing people or that they were making war on people or whatever they were doing, there were people involved in that thing. And I, I want to start with this psychological moment too because I think it's important in what we do when we make models. I say that um, because I have it sat in, the, in this museum dusting models and watched little kids come through and looking at what I'm doing, and um, they stay, the young kids even seem to know something about what's going on and start to do this same thing. They look, they're fascinated, they're imagining something. You can see them and they ask questions that suggest that they're trying to get into the picture of this boat that's in front of me. Very young. Very young. Now, I'm not going to try and elaborate that this is what was going on in uh, 2000 BC when Egyptians made votive boats that they put into tombs, or that people were doing this in the Admiralty in 18 whatever it is when they made models of ships to deliver to the Navy Board. Um, they had a different purpose, but now, when we build models, I think we're very much involved in this imaginative process. That when I'm working on models, I am sure that I'm getting satisfaction from my hands, watching them do the things with the tools, feeling comfortable with the tools, or very often in my mind elaborating a technique to do something so that I produce a regular finish on a piece of wood or portholes that are of the same size or some kind of fitting that I want to all look the same so that when you just glance at it or look at it from six feet away it looks like it comes out of a shop, that it's not something that each one was done laboriously and they're all a little different. So I'm getting that satisfaction of craft that I'm sure if you approach this at all, you understand what I mean, weighs 
of applying glue so that when you put the two pieces together, you don't have a big runny glob of it come down the side of the piece of wood or of the piece of plastic that you're working on. You get satisfaction from it, but at the same time, I at least can guarantee you that I'm always thinking stories about what's going on inside this model. That it is a sailing ship that is doing something, that it's doing something human, and I've never done these things. I'm entering into a story that I never participated in. I never went whaling. I never, uh, I have sailed. Uh, and um, I have some experience gained from that. But really my satisfaction with playing with models doesn't have much to do with my actual experience of sailing. That is going to be different for everybody. But I submit that even people who have sailed and are doing this as an extension of their sailing experience are very likely also to be having an imaginative experience when they're building models as well as a craft physical experience. Dalt never finished the model helicopter, by the way. Uh, before long, he suggested that he might make an aquarium for me instead. Um, and we were up and at that in no time, and I can't remember what it was he stocked the aquarium with. I'm, I've made aquariums all the rest of my life as well as done models. So this is um, a very important moment in my recollection of my childhood. I have to say this day was really, was, was a great one. Um, I can remember the gigantic pair of forceps that we had to use to use. We fed whatever it was that was in the aquarium it had to be fed bloodworms that we picked up with these forceps. It's so vivid in my mind. It's as vivid as the little helicopter. Again, I think that he may have abandoned the helicopter because he didn't want to have to do the completion of it that would have required rotors and other things that he was going to have a lot more trouble whittling. But we did talk many times. He was a sculptor. He was a metal crafter. And one of his sons has become an extremely uh, accomplished luthier, a violin maker in Washington, D.C. Um, and this brother and I had many conversations afterwards about crafts mostly related to old automobiles and their restoration. Um, and really, it sort of was the end of our model building experience that day. However, uh, I can remember that not too long after that, I was uh, involved in this post-World War II experience of building all of the aircraft that we flew and that the Japanese flew and that the Germans flew and then that the Chinese flew. Uh, the North Koreans, perhaps, would be more accurate. Um, the uh, joyful experience of uh, assembling these plastic models was only equaled by the experience of stuffing them with more of this glue. It was Duco cement from DuPont. Uh, in their tails, uh, often putting firecrackers in them as well, lighting them, spinning them around on strings until they were ready for a good crash landing. And while we did it, we were narrating the event with radio transmissions and uh, all sorts of stories about disasters that were happening and hero heroic activities. And, it was very much what we did. Uh, How big was this with your hands? This is 48 to 1 scale, which means that if you multiplied it by 48 times, it would be maybe about 30 feet long, 35 feet long. That's, I mean, the model itself was about so big. About so big. That's what mm -hmm. I want to know. Right. Um, we did literally dozens and dozens and dozens of these. Uh, ships as well. Uh, don't be taken aback because it's an airplane. Mm -hmm. I was also very fascinated with the submarine service and uh, loved making submarines and other kinds of ships that were popular at the time. Uh, obviously this is one that was considered considerably later. This is the Nautilus which was an, our first nuclear sub and it came out in the 50s. 
I was already making the other classes of submarines from World War II at that time. Um, I should also mention a summer camp I attended in the early 1950s, Lantern Hill Camp uh, in Ledyard, Connecticut, which is about eight miles from where Mystic Seaport is. Mystic Seaport was just opening in 1951 or 52. I went to it every summer for those years in the early 50s when I was learning how to swim and to canoe in, uh, in the pond out there behind the camp. Um, but very importantly, I was also in the crafts room. And in my group, I have to say I was like, I excelled. I had the star for being the craft guy in whatever cabin it was, um, largely because of doing things like spending an entire summer carving one squirrel and sanding it. Um, I remember the crafts guy teaching me that he said, woodwork is about sanding. Sanding determines the quality of woodwork, woodwork. And taught me about different grades of sandpaper and how you move down to the finer ones and ultimately made a finish that you would polish. I myself think it really has much more to do with simply with patience, but uh, I guess it's, it's not entirely unrelated to the sanding lesson that I got from Lantern Hill Camp. Back in Washington, I continued to build models. Now I was inventing buried treasure stories to go with the ships, empires to defend with the planes, drawing treasure maps and designing currency to go with these countries, etc., as well as building models to do this kind of stuff. I built plastic satellites. I remember putting one up in a tree and thinking, well, it is actually rotating somehow in space, but never mind. Um, I've made rocket ships to go up the alley and uh, shoot these things. And um, you probably did many of these things too if you're of the same age in the 1950s. It was about rockets. That was where the fun was. Um, and they moved, and they made, they made the, the bang, smash, sound, and smoke, and all the rest of it. And it was great. Um, until we left Washington for a spell in Geneva that changed my life in many, many ways, including being the scene of my coming of age in internal combustion, which I will avoid tonight, because otherwise we will not get back to model ships. Um, Motorcycles and to some extent old cars have been um, a passion for my entire life. Uh, when I returned to the U.S. to go to college, I got to know that other half-brother, Jim, a lot better. Uh, as his house became my surrogate home, my parents being still in Europe, uh, much of his attention was given to building a model train set. Um, a layout. It wasn't a set. It was a permanent installation in the attic of a rather large colonial. And at various places it went to two levels. It was a scale model of a train line that he created with his own name. He got decals made for the cars. It was a train line that ran from Hartford to where their country house was near Rutland, Vermont. And he built houses that were all along the way, including their houses, including bars in Hartford. I remember there was Dalton's Bar, which is the other brother's bar. Uh, and his wife Judy's pawn shop was on another corner. It was, um, it was a fabulous thing. And he built it all in HO scale, which is the first time I've said that word tonight. And for those of you that are listening to me and don't really have a lot of experience in this, we need to talk about this business of scale a little bit. Uh, HO gauge actually refers to the separation between two rails. That's a distance between the wheels of a car. But it also reflects a scale, and it's 87 to 1. So when your train car is this long, you have to imagine 87 of them to get an idea of the whole length of that one car. And the scale, obviously, between Hartford and Vermont was not 87 to 1 in this attic. But there were fanciful moments 
when you would go through a tunnel and now you'd be in northern Massachusetts or you'd now be and it would change. But when you got to a place, it was all in this scale of HO. This makes a person a little less than an inch tall. Um, I spent many, many evenings at their home at, in, during my college years. As I say, it was, they were my, sort of my surrogate parents when I came back to college. And I began building models again. I remember at this point building a uh, 15 or 18 inch long Gertrude L. Thibault uh, schooner. This was really the first difficult model ship that I did. And I say difficult because it was fully rigged, or at least as fully as the plans intended. I, of course, now know that a, even a model ship that you rig pretty well is not anywhere near as rigged as a real running square rigged vessel. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit at the end. I have a book to send you to if you really are interested in knowing what every rope or cord on a ship is about. Um, by this time, this was still a plastic model kit. It was uh, very challenging. I used Ambroid glue by now. Duco was not good enough. This was just another polystyrene cement that uh, model ship and train builders were using at the time. Um, I remember thinking at the time that the quality and the satisfaction of building models was going to increase with the size of the scale. That this 96 to 1 was difficult because of the size, in part. That it was hard to make it as clean, hard to make it as, as regular, and threading pulleys that are the size of chia seeds yes. very much will lead you to uh, the narratives become cluttered with expletives, <laughs> and it, they, it's not as much fun. It's just not as much fun. Um, so I think that probably, unless you're talking about a watchmaker like Charles Niles, who made many of the ships that are in the collection next door, who was a jeweler and watchmaker, um, that if you don't have that kind of dexterity and those loops to look at what you're doing, um, that you probably do better with larger scale uh, to do it well. Doing ships in bottles obviously requires you to do the ship in very small scale, unless you have a very large bottle. Uh, so back to this fellow Jim, uh, my brother, he was using sheets of thin milled wood to side those houses with. And I myself am now, again, remembering starting to build a house out of wood next to him and trying to make individual boards instead of walls that were a single piece of wood cut out and scribed with the markings of the, of the wood and learning that it was really very difficult to nail things down when they were cardstock thin and three millimeters wide without splitting them or causing problems. I learned at that point about pin drills and how to put a pin drill through a piece of wood before then putting the nail in it. Um, in short, drilling the nail hole before putting the nail into it. The only way to avoid splitting and damaging the piece of wood. Um, but this is the kind of work you do where you um, measure the size of a pin head, and I mean a sewing pin head, to determine whether you think it will make an appropriate doorknob for the house or whether it's going to be too big. And filing it if it is. 
Um, while I was in college, my mother uh, finally retired from work in Geneva, and she bought a ruin in Provence to fix up as a retirement project of her own. And this pile of stone, iron, and wood has become my one of my greatest projects. Uh, I work on it all the time, six months of the year, and um, have learned to do a great deal uh, that I never expected. Some of it almost related to what we're doing. It also occasioned my discovering the port of Marseille, and I fell in love with this old harbor and these boats. And uh, one of my earliest real wooden shipbuilding model projects um, was to build one of these sardine fishing boats from uh, the Mediterranean. By now, I had married the charming French woman who is sitting in front of me, and we had our first son, and the prospect of building something which I could then go and sail on the pond in New York City um, also entered the picture. So I was talking about building an operating version of this. I um, don't know if this is going to be clear to you, but this is basically molds for building a model ship on. Uh, you see I've been lazy and skipped two of them. That's because I determined that if I bent the piece of wood around the outside of this, it would make a perfect curve and didn't really need to make the other ones. And I was very lazy, partly because I got plans for this which were half this scale. That is to say, it was a, a plans for something that was going to be um, something like 25 to 1, and I wanted to double it to make it 12 and a half to 1, just to make it bigger, to be able to play with it. And so I had to take the lines from the plans, the plan of the ship has all of these curves, uh, which are ultimately repeated here. And in order to save making two forms, I did this. I mea culpa, I feel guilty. But you, what you do now is you cut a keel piece that goes all the way around. You could either cut a single piece out of some kind of furniture grade plywood, or you could take a piece at the front and a piece at the back, and that's set, attach them to the piece that's going to lo lie here, a stem and a stern piece in short. Um, I did this with plywood and sealed it with epoxy paint and assembled the whole thing, now using product from a company called Uhu, U-H-U in Germany, Uhu Hart, which professed to be permanently waterproof, and it has done pretty well. The boat still holds together, has no cracks between any of the boards. Fully planked, uh, fully built up with seats and sails, and assembled with the tire for the bumper in the front. Uh, and ballast for the inside. As you can see, this is a, a boat that is intended to and has a, a large triangular sail called a Latin sail. And uh, we did sail it successfully on the pond in Central Park with, again, stories. Uh, Stuart Little, the race, remember? Um, that was definitely on our minds as we were sailing it. I say we, I don't know, but I mean, Simon, my son, was there. We were having a great time, um, and he learned a great deal about this, I suppose, from doing it, but I was having a ball. Mm -hmm. So this one is this, with your hands. This is this one. Thank you. And a person in it would be standing up about this tall. You pray okay. with prayer. I mean, you can have a long stick, um, but once it gets out there in the middle, it, it, you need wind. It's better to do this on a windy day than a calm day, for sure. Uh, but it, it sails. It, it didn't get away. It, it would do what you wanted it to do. You can also lash the tiller in a particular way if you want as you go. But um, This was a radio control. Not a radio control. I was at this point playing with radio-controlled airplane, 
um, uh, with a four foot, eight foot wingspan that was also hanging from the ceiling in my boy's room when he was growing up. Um, I, 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 just, I didn't want to do that. I just, I just thought, thought but hey, yes, I hear you. Um, no, radio control. I'd love to do it. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to get started with that. Um, again. Huh? I do love the sailboat pond. And I also... And there are people there that are radio controlled and people who aren't oh, yeah. respectful of each other. Yes. And there's powered boats as well. <laughs> I never actually joined the club and left the boat there. I have a, a carrying case for it. And, and it's... Uh, it was a lot of satisfaction, a lot of fun. Um, I got into this sail pattern, this Latin rig, from doing Mediterranean boats. I built a Roman galley for a friend and mounted it in a large box that I uh, think was probably the first diorama I did. And I've gotten very much involved in dioramas, which is to say creating scenes in boxes not always naval scenes by any means, usually not, as a matter of fact. But um, I got enough involved in this sail form to sort of want to try and build everything in every sea that had a Latin rig. And it is the, um, the kind of, of sail that is on Arabian boats that sail in the Arabian Sea down to uh, uh, Zanzibar on the coast of Africa and down to Bombay on the coast of India. Uh, and actually when I was doing a workshop in, uh, in Africa in 1986, I managed to get on one of these that was piloted by a Somali boy and uh, get out onto the water in one with a, an outboard rudder that, that you know, sort of like a, a catamaran, but, uh, or a, they call a yacht in Dutch, that big plank on the side of the boat to stabilize it. Um, so I got involved in this kind of thing as well. And um, the height of this period was undoubtedly building the Jeanne Amélie, a small bark of Italian manufacture that rescued Edmond Dantes from the waters off of the Chateau d'If in Book One of the Count of Monte Cristo. Are you with me? <laughs> Um, I had spent two years of my early professional career in audio making a radio dramatization of the novel, so I started on the ship with the story already in my mind. And I started to look for the appropriate plans. At this point I discovered the museum, actually I discovered the museum of ships in Paris when I was building that sardine fisher, that's where I got the plans for it, and I also got plans for this tartan there and um, started to build the uh, Jeanne Amélie, um, adapted slightly to match Dumas' description with a boxwood frame, but I have no knowledge of how shipbuilders on the north coast of the Mediterranean actually constructed their frames. That is to say, these, these ribs that go around, um, the Admiralty builds them with two sets that are joined together and like bricks, they will only have cracks that are opposite a solid piece of wood so that the ribs are completely solid wishbones with absolutely no breaks in them. Totally trundled, that's tree nailed together so that they are totally rigid. I myself just looked at the plans, said this is, this is what I got to do. I had to make frames from uh, forms that I transferred from the plans to cardboard molding frames, molding patterns. And I made all of the frames and mounted them on a boxwood keel with a boxwood stem and stern and boxwood railings to hold it together. This, everything there is all the box. The, um, when you point it that, we don't stop I'm translated sorry. up to there. Here. Yeah, absolutely. This is only the second time I've ever done a PowerPoint lecture in my life. But uh, I, I really detest them. But this one's working very nicely. I mean, I have to say, I'll, I'm, I'm almost convinced. This is all boxwood. 
uh, even these little pieces here that are holding the tops of the frames ready for the gunnels to sit on so that the, they, are, they don't move, they don't bend, nobody bumps them and breaks them off. But these are continuous pieces that go down to below there and then they join and that's every joint has been doweled, drilled out and a wooden piece has been put between. They are all mortised and every one of those is pre-drilled and then the glue is introduced and you push the in. I made this all with um, uh, what's called Franklin's liquid hide glue, which you can still get uh, in the United States, although it's not in most hardware stores anymore. They sell these vinylic carpenter's wood glues, which I frankly, I frankly don't like them at all. I don't know what anybody else thinks about them, but I don't think they penetrate the wood, and I don't think they harden as hard as the wood. This liquid hide glue is basically an animal collagen. It is traditionally made from rabbits, uh, rabbit skin melted down, cooked up and made into like little gelatin pellets which you then put into water and cook. But Franklin liquid hide glue has got some stabilizer in it that allows it to be liquid at room temperature in normal circumstances so that you can use it without having to have a little pot of it heated up before you have a session. But it does dry as hard as, as, hard as amber resin and uh, it can be also melted with a hair dryer and moisture. So you can in fact reverse it and it's fabulous stuff. I wouldn't recommend doing this kind of work with anything else. And it's the best as far as I can see for attaching veneer as well. It's got very long drying time, penetrates nicely, and hardens like a rock. May I ask what you apply it with? Like a toothpick? Or? Yeah, a tooth. I make, honestly, it depends on what you're applying it to and where you want it to go. I make new applicators all the time while I'm working. Most of the of the wooden doweling in here is made with surgical applicator um, wood. The kind of thing that is on a, a, a doctor's desk. You see these wooden swabs that have cotton on a wooden stem. At least they used to before they started making them all with a cheaper cotton cardboard substitute. But I, you can get boxes of these stack of this of the sticks. They're about a millimeter and a half in diameter, and I use them for for making doweling, and, and I also use them for making applicators for the glue, and cut the tips of them into different shapes so that you can push the glue down into the place and smooth it, scrape it off, etc. Constantly doing this, constantly. Um, anyway, um, my, my experience of this period is inseparable from two shops. One of them was a startup at the South Street Seaport Museum in, in New York City where a guy had gotten a store given to him or rented to him or assigned to make a model ship shop. I don't know if any of you were uh, in New York in the 1980s. Yeah. But, hmm? But he had a fabulous store there uh, where he sold model shipway models which have the solid wood hulls and are pretty much, uh, you know, they're, they're really quite advanced model kits. Um, oh, this is, by the way, the tartan completed. Um, it is this big from stem to stern, uh, 1 50th scale. Um, I think, again, this is my feeling uh, for uh, uh, the smallest scale that I would want to work in. Um, the British Navy models, what are called Naval Board or Admiralty models, are 48 to 1, which is to say one quarter of an inch to one foot. And that's about the same size as this. It is possible to do anything in this scale, to make working doorknobs and latches and 
hatch combings that will remove, and everything is just, you know, so much easier when you've got a scale like this to work with. I'm, I'll talk about this ship's boat again in a little bit in a minute, but I'll finish this uh, parenthesis about the shops. Good shops are, uh, are I think, are getting to be harder to find. Uh, the, 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 the thing in South Street Seaport, he had veneer woods in different qualities and different thicknesses and different kinds of wood. He had milled boxwood in different dimensions. And boxwood is the, the, the hardest wood I know of and takes a line and you can really, really work it. It's very hard to work, but it's, I, I recommend it if you're going to do framing for this kind of thing. And then what you put on that will not move. Castello Sorry? Castello Cas Castello. Is that a, a brand or a, or a species? Species. A species? Yeah. Um, I think it comes from Spain or Europe or Southern Europe. Well, there, I would... I'm a mother too, so I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, and you buy box, this something yeah. called Castello Boxwood? Yeah. There's a couple of places a couple of companies here in the United States that make it. The, the, the they, sell they it. Get it yeah. Augustine yeah. Lumber mm -hmm. still exists, a place called Augustine. Um, yeah, well, Constantine. 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 No, um, that one I'm not familiar with. Well, was they were in the Bronx for a yeah. while, but then they yeah. moved to Florida. I'm not sure if they still exist. Well, model Shipways is still around. They're yes. in Florida. Right. They go by Model X Club. Uh -huh. Model Shipways is owned by Model it used to be in Jersey and New York, so. Well, this is very useful information to me. I, I would uh, put it on my bibliography if I had known it, but uh, I will uh, I'll take the note from you. Um, anyway, I bought this model ship from him. There's one of these in the, uh, in the museum here. It is originally the Harriet K. Lane. This is, uh, I believe, 144 to 1, very small scale. That people would be even smaller than, much smaller than H.O. Gage people, less, you know, like maybe a half an inch tall mm -hmm. for people running around on this. You can see from the size of the railings that are intended to keep them from falling off, that's about how, how big the people would be. Um, I did this as the CSS Lavinia, the ship was, um, um, you say, was captured by the Confederate Navy in Galveston and uh, sailed under a Confederate flag for a number of years. I had a Confederate flag on it, it's gone now, but, uh, and a Confederate naval flag is a little different from the regular Confederate stars and bars. Um, but um, the second shop, that I wanted to mention was hidden away inside a courtyard in a street in Paris. It was called Chez Staub. And a friend of ours who's a sailor and a woodworker told me about it. They had a catalog of ship fittings that utterly decked me. I have to say that they had everything for tiny ships from ancient to modern in various scales, wood, brass, pot, metal, you name it, they had it. Alas, long since closed. Um, this is, if I, could tell you a different outcome, I would. Uh, but at this point, I don't know where I would go to get that kind of, they had all of the fret work, the kind of raised relief work that you could put on the stern of uh, 18th century, 19th century ships, decorative frills, etc., uh, in different scales for different size of models. Uh, but you can make this kind of thing, and you can buy it also in photo etched uh, packets from various model makers, including people in Belgium, maybe in this uh, the catalog in Florida. The, these people, do they have this, this kind of stuff? Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember where the guys are getting their photo etched stuff from. Mm -hmm. like in Germany. Right. Germany and, and Belgium and Luxembourg and even France, they, they make this stuff mostly for train layouts is what they're thinking. Um, I know that I 
I built a diorama, a picture of a, a street in in Eastern Africa, and wanted railings for the balconies. Managed to find just about everything by, again, lengthy searches in train model shops, finding the catalog, writing to the companies, etc. Um, so I knew from the story, as I said, of this um, Count of Monte Cristo boat that the uh, that Edmond Dantes had gone ashore on the island of Monte Cristo. The plans didn't include a ship's boat, but I said I was going to modify this model to fit the novel, and so I carved from a solid piece of cherry and scribed the planking on it. This little ship's boat. It is literally this long. Uh, and carved benches and floorboards and everything out of the wood that I took out of the middle of it. Uh, the, the oars are in a different kind of wood, as is the tiller, but um, the rest of it is in wild cherry from the backyard. Uh, and I still have a stack of milk cherry wood from that tree that um, I'm hoping to build uh, something else with. Who knows what? Um, my boys were now two in number, and I had uh, a couple of nephews of the same age. The fun of sailing a boat in the park wasn't always easy to schedule, so I decided to turn my thoughts to a good bathtub model project. Um, I always wanted to be a submariner. The Navy rejected me because I'm too tall. And I really loved the USS Monitor, so, um, gee, this thing is going nuts. So I went to a library of all places and got these uh, plans for a monitor, um, took the uh, plans and blew them up to the scale so that, so that the thickness of the, of, the, of the deck up here was three quarters of an inch, which is what a finished plank of pine comes to, and scaled the rest of it accordingly, uh, made a turret for it appropriate, again, in dimension. This this height here has become three quarters of an inch, and everything else is dependent on that, because I was just being lazy again and doing what I could with the wood that was in the, in the cupboard. Um, and, but now I have to tell you that I'm not really sure that that's how the story started, because I had begun collecting the lead wrappers off of the tops of wine bottles and flattening them and saying to myself, these things are too good to throw out. And um, by now I had quite a stack of these sheets of metal, which I wanted to use for something. And I think the project may have come out of the junk that was piling up on my workbench. Um, I was also taking the thin, thin, thin brass wire off of champagne bottles and wrapping it so that it was straight and ultimately made this which again was made for children's hands so I have no hesitation in passing it around. Uh, it's been in many battles and um, it's all been uh, made out of uh, basically plain old pine with um, Two little Dahlgren cannons that came from model shipways, probably intended for the Harriet K. Lane. Uh, stanchions and railings from model shipways and Shea Staub, and the, um, the wire from champagne bottles. All of this was done with uh, five minute epoxy, which has become my go to glue for putting this stuff together and not having to wait around. Um, can't be reversed. Um, it can often be peeled off, but you know, it kind of asks for commitment. Um, I love it. The details, like the, the propeller, etc., all of this comes from model shipways. I'm sure, if not from uh, from my friends in Paris. So what's this all about, I ask you? Why do we make these things? What need does it fulfill? And since now I know some of you have actually done this, and I suspect it actually 
most of you have. <laughs> no, not you. We're going to get to that too. I have a point about that. Um, what need does it fulfill, so to speak? And what does it have to do with the models that surround us in this museum? Um, this isn't a simple subject. It'll take, it could take the rest of the evening. We could talk about it as long as you like. When sailors make models of these ships, they are clearly honoring the memory of being at sea. Uh, when shipbuilders make them in connection with building real ships that they want to sell to the Admiralty and they want to show them the features or the details, how they've met the codes, how they've done, they're doing something else. But that was 1715 that they passed that law that made the shipbuilders have to submit the models. And they stopped doing it in 1832. Um, they still build ship models, and shipbuilders still ask for models of ships, very often for the owners to display in cases in their offices. If it's a shipping line, they will want to have models of their ships to decorate their offices with. Uh, these are reasons for building, I, but I trust that none of you have ever done that. You've not been called upon to do that. No, um, which is why I'm sure there's something else going on. And I'm virtually certain that it has to do with enjoying this, can I say, uh, it's, an, it's an enjoyable pastime. This is the finished model which we've now actually been passing around. Um, if you want to talk about the history again of this, I would have declined to do this lecture within the short time frame that I was given. That is to say, I was asked to do this about a half a year ago, and I've had much more time to prepare than I really should have. I should have spent much more time doing it. But to study the history of making ships and the reasons why people have done it since uh, 3000 BC and now, there would be a long, long evening for you. Um, and I wouldn't do it with anything less than that sort of serious detail. I have done some in preparation for you. Um, and in fact, if I was to make a, a, um, a, an outline for it, it would begin with religious and votive purposes. People made these ships the Egyptian model that I showed you a picture of, 3000 BC. The Strauss family, famous Abraham and Strauss stores, the Strauss family that had a person that died, two people that died on the Titanic. Their family mausoleum depicts a trireme sailing on the sea. This is a solemn depiction of crossing over into death. And this is definitely one of the original reasons why people made ships. It is stressed that in the ancient world, these were the most sophisticated pieces of technology, the most wondrous things that human hands did. People built houses, and people built these ships. Anything else you can think of that they built that was this kind of size, this kind of complexity? It's, a, it's an interesting argument. Um, that certainly it struck people with awe. The Romans built models very much like this and paraded them in their triumphs when their armies and navies came back and marched through Rome in victory. They are trophies. And that still holds when you start talking about ship companies having a model ship of their biggest and best pieces of equipment on the line. They have, that's a trophy. It's something they're showing you with pride. It doesn't show uh, the, tr the crossing over into death. But the Romans weren't showing you that either when they marched them through Rome. They were showing you their power, their might, their technological superiority, whatever. Um, so there's the trophy. There's also toys. People made toys for the longest time out of these ships. I made a little uh, outline for, of this, which I'm sure you can 
Maybe C? No? Not at all. Um, I've gotten you through the Greeks and Romans and the ancient world a little bit uh, on a discussion of this. In the Middle Ages, very few. We have very few examples of them. We do have a toy that has survived from 1130, approximately. You can get an idea of the size of the thing from the woman's hand that's holding it. Online, you can actually see her turn it over. I wasn't quite sure how I could put that into a PowerPoint. But this thing has a keel coming from this prow underneath it, a carved raised keel, and um, a step for the mast. And this is basically from Viking country. This is from the time when the Vikings were the masters of the northern seas in Europe, 1120. We're, not, we're talking about 50 years after um, the Norman conquest of England, which happened in boats very much like this, which is to say little dishes, open boats, one square sail in the middle. And a lot of guys throwing water over the edge as fast as they could. By the way, you, you can't embed videos in PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could. I just didn't make it. Didn't make it. It didn't make it to this. It took me more than two tries. <laughs> I will, I'll keep working on that. Um, I'd actually rather be dusting models, but um, <laughs> what can I tell you? Um, the, I've never made a votive ship. I've made toys, I've now told you. Um, votive objects are still known. This is the nave of the church of Notre Dame de la Garde in Marseille, where ship uh, models are hanging from this, the roof of the church and have been since 1880. So these are more recent than you perhaps suspect. These are thank yous to the Virgin for saving people at sea. There are also paintings on the walls. Some of the sailors would paint their thank yous, but many of them at this time, in the 19th century, were, would carve a model to offer to the church in thanks. So the business of making votive models and having a, a wish, the votive, the word votive means it, it is connected with a wish. Um, and the wish being, again, to honor the ship and very possibly also to thank somebody for a miracle that got them home. Um, again, I've never done this, which is to build a true admiralty model. This is what I'm saying. Uh, you can buy this kind of uh, elaborate fretwork. I, would, I suspect that we can do it in England. I'm, I'm very interested in finding out what's going on in England and have the intention of joining a, uh, uh, a workshop there in 2018, if anybody's interested. I found out about a workshop at, uh, in, in, at the National Maritime Museum. And if you'd like to come, I'm not going to pay your way, but I'm, I'm going. Um, and, I'll, and I'll bring back any details that I can for you. So um, I made operating models as toys. Um, and that word, I think, is maybe the, the answer to the question. If I were to give you an answer to the question, what am I doing, and what is it that motivates us 20th, 21st century modelers, come on, from, this is for play, right? He said toys. We're making toys, not necessarily for our kids, don't touch that, um, for ourselves. And I don't want to get into this boys and their toys thing too deeply, but it is I do intend to close on the question of gendering of this because it's the 21st century and that's all we talk about these days. So we have to at least mention that female model ship builders are rarer than female skateboarders. And I want you to know there are female skateboarders. 
I was really thrilled to see two women working out there in the shipyard. Here. A little surprised, perhaps, but less so today than I would have been 20 years ago. Yeah? Well, things are changing. You notice that a woman is the co-pilot of the current winner of Formula One races in the United States in, a, in an Acura 